I also acknowledge that it's always good to be in a dojo because you created that kind of family, friendship, and you learn. Hello and welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 564, with today's guest, Senpai Yves Gokunde. I'm Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host on the show. I'm the founder of Whistlekick. And I'm a guy. I'm just a guy who loves martial arts. And that's why we do what we do. And if you want to see all that we do, head on over to whistlekick.com. That's where you're going to see all the projects that we're involved in, the things that we do for the love of traditional martial arts. One of the things you'll find there is our store. And that's one of the ways that we raise money to fund the stuff that we do. And if you find something there that you like, use the code PODCAST15. Helps us know that you listen to the show. Speaking of the show, if you want to learn more, if you want to get more in-depth with this or any other episode, go to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. We've got a separate page for every single episode we've ever done. Yes, they're all available, all there for you, for free, two new shows a week, and it's all because we look forward to connecting, educating, and entertaining traditional martial artists throughout the world. And if this resonates for you, if this is something that you say, you know, Jeremy, I appreciate what you guys are doing over there. And you want to help? Well, you've got a lot of ways you can help. You could make a purchase. You could share an episode with a friend on social media or just reach out and say, hey, did you hear this? You could check out one of our books we sell on Amazon. You could leave a review on whatever podcast platform you listen to this on. Or you could support our Patreon. Patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash whistlekick. It's a place to go. You can support with as little as $2 a month. And we give you more content. And the more you contribute, the more we give you. In fact, I would say that we work really, really hard to make sure that you get more than you give. That's really our basic philosophy. We give you this show and so much else for free. And then if you give us a little bit, we'll give you even more. It's a pretty good deal. Well, today's guest comes from, well, I'm going to let him tell you where he comes from. I'm going to let him tell you where he is now. But throughout it all, we hear this thread of martial arts as something to lean on, something that you can always go back to, something that can help define who we are, no matter what's happening around us. It's one of my favorite things about martial arts, that there's no one size fits all. It's whatever you want to put on. And so here we are with today's guest, Senpai Gakunde. Welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Thank you so much for having me. Hey, it's great having you. We're, you know, (laughs) one of the things I love about martial arts is that martial arts is about as global as you get. Martial arts is everywhere. And one of the things I also love is the number of times I get on a call with someone to record an episode and find out that they aren't that far away from me right now. (laughs) You're you're just over two hours away. I'm right here in your neighborhood. (laughs) You are. You are. And it. You know, and it shouldn't surprise me. It does make sense because, you know, here I am in New England. Most of the martial artists I know are in New England. So when we get connections and and recommendations for guests, quite often they're, if they're not in New England, they used to live in New England. Everybody seems to have this tie to New England. And maybe it's just, you know, just how I see it. But mm-hmm. I feel really fortunate to live here as, I mean, it's weird. It's 60 degrees out here, despite being December 1st and there's no snow on the ground, but yeah, it's a beautiful place to live. Definitely is. Now, of course, we could talk weather and we could talk geography and we could talk about probably an unlimited list of things that you and I would find interesting to talk about. But the audience is not here to hear that. They're here to talk about or listen about martial arts. Mm -hmm. And so here we are. We're on a martial arts show. I've got pictures of you wearing a gi. So the question is, when did you start that? How did you get started as a martial artist? Oh, well, um, that's a good question. Uh, I started uh, martial arts, I would say, in uh, 1996. But before that, I used to practice a little bit uh, with my uh, older brother, my late older brother. Mm -hmm. Um, Like, we will be home watching uh, movies about, like, Bruce Lee, you know, Jean-Claude Van Damme, Jackie yeah. Chan, all those like classic movies. <laughs> uh, the Karate Kid with, with Mr. Miyagi. And uh, uh, we're 
always like want to do like uh, a little bit of like movement to this and that. So I will step out, out outside the house with my brother and we'll do like uh, movements that we, we saw in the movie. But none of us was really in a uh, in club, no, in the school of uh, uh, martial mm-hmm. arts. So we just like do practice what we saw in the movie. And that's uh, kind of how we started. And then later on, when I went to um, high school, that's uh, when I joined the um, uh, karate, uh, karate uh, club. Yeah. All right. Did the movies inspire the interest in martial arts or did your interest in martial arts lead you to watch those movies? I think I think I got in, interested because of the movies, actually, um, uh, because karate was not uh, a like a huge thing in Rwanda. You know, mm. um, I remember back back in those days, there were very few people who were practicing karate. In fact, karate at that time, in back in nineteen eight uh, five. Karate was only, or martial arts was only for uh, military personnel. So not not like uh, uh, civilians were allowed to to practice karate. So uh, when I was growing up, I probably knew um, two or three people who uh, were in martial arts, and that was it. Um, but uh, the action movies and uh, especially like martial arts movies are very popular, were very popular and are still popular in Rwanda. So watching those movies, I think, really ignited the passion <laughs> of martial arts uh, in me. <laughs> and so I think there's an important time, and, and we're going to talk about this. You already alluded to something that I, I, I'm sure we'll get into. Mm-hmm. But at some point, you moved from Rwanda to the U.S. When did that happen? Uh, so I came uh, in, uh, in the U.S. August 2010, and I moved here uh, to uh, pursue my graduate school uh, in a small college called uh, Antioch University, New England, which is right here in Keene. So since uh, 2010, August 2010, I have been uh, here in, uh, in uh, between New Hampshire and Vermont. Okay. Yeah. So you 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 did start martial arts in Rwanda. Yeah, I did. Uh, I started oh, okay. martial arts in Rwanda, and uh, I practiced uh, in uh, in Rwanda at the time. It was not until I moved to Keene that I started joining a small um, uh, club here in Keene uh, once in a while, uh, but most of the time, like my trainings, my um, Karate experiences from from Rwanda, and anybody who knows the history of Rwanda around this time knows how um, I think chaotic mm-hmm. might be might be a good word. You certainly, I'm sure, have better words and and much more context for what was going on there. You said that when you were younger, learning martial arts wasn't was it was it illegal or just not a not something that was done it was illegal actually it was, it was not okay. yeah it was not allowed uh, and when so did that change it changed around 1987 so that's when they allowed people to practice karate uh in public and did that lead to a, a lot of people starting to train in lots of schools or did it take quite a while it did take a quite a while there were just few few people who i knew um and uh, I was actually um, uh, lucky enough to uh, have been trained with one of the first people to start uh, karate in Rwanda, uh, Sensei Sinzi Tarsis. Um, so it did take quite a while to get where uh, Rwanda is now in terms of uh, martial arts. Mm-hmm. Now it's developed, but at, at that time uh, it was very limited. There were now many schools. I think they were probably one, um, less than five, or say less than five schools mm. in the country. It's a small country, about uh, a little bit bigger than Vermont, uh, if I can make a, a comparison. Uh, but um, it's uh, 
we have about 12 million people. So many people, a small country, and karate was not big at, at that time. I find it interesting when we, when we talk about historical events like this, where mm -hmm. martial arts wasn't allowed, where it was restricted or, or even illegal. It doesn't take long yeah. for martial arts to, to kind of find its way in once, once that door is open. And, you know, another country I'm thinking about is Brazil, where martial arts was maybe not illegal. I don't know my history quite on at that level. Mm -hmm. I know it was restricted. Yeah. And here we had capoeira. And now when people think of martial arts in the world, Brazil's a country they think of because of Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Yeah. Yeah. And so you mentioned your, you, you mentioned someone, you mentioned a sensei. Yeah. And you know, used, used a few words to speak very highly of him. How, how did you get connected with him? So when I, when I started, um, uh, I was uh, in uh, high school, so uh, in, in the south, uh, the southern part of Rwanda. And um, we started, uh, it was a boarding school. Uh, and when we started, uh, our uh, Sampai had a green belt, you know, uh, but we were learning from like books, movies, as I said, we are really using any like, resources we could find uh, to practice. Uh, that boarding school was not far from uh, the National University of Rwanda. And uh, that way, that's where uh, Sensei Sinzi Tarsis uh, was based at. So he was working there. Of course, he was living in that uh, that same town as well, in the south, the southern part of Rwanda, and um, we were just like go uh, to the University of Rwanda for like only testing or during the holidays uh, or uh, when the schools were not in session, we will go. I will go train with him uh, because he had a bigger uh, club that was where were uh, known and it's still were known in Rwanda. So me going uh, to train with him uh, and uh, doing like testing um, with him really, we became uh, very connected. And um, uh, after that, uh, after that uh, boarding school, so I, w I was there for three years and then I moved uh, in uh, another uh, boarding school because I changed uh, uh, what I was studying. So when I got to that uh, second uh, boarding school, so in, in Rwanda, the, the system we had to, you had to do the first three years as a general studies, and then the last three years as uh, focus studies. So um, I want to do, I did, uh, uh, biology and chemistry so it was like more science uh, focused mm -hmm. so when i moved to that uh, second school um uh, they there was a, a very strong uh, uh, club and uh it was uh, um the, the, the uh, sensei Paul emir kajugu was uh, was uh, our sensei there and he was one of uh uh, the top uh, three um, students in uh, um, in Rwanda at that time it was really good, very good fighter. If I remember correctly, there were many years when I was there. He was actually the champion um, in Rwanda. So I got trained under uh, Paul Emir um, for uh, about uh, two three years, and. Uh, uh, he uh, he left a really big mark uh, uh, into my uh, uh, karate experience. So after that, uh, after those three years, then I went to the to the university. Uh, of course, I went to the University of Rwanda, where uh, Sensei Sinzu Tarsis was. You can uh, you can uh, imagine that was like uh, me living in paradise. <laughs> 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 He's a very, uh, very well respected man. Uh, not only because he um, he's one of the people who started karate in Rwanda, 
but also uh, he's considered as a hero in the Rwandan history uh, because of uh, uh, what, uh, how he helped people survive during the genocide uh, back in 1994. So uh, there's so much about him uh, and it's, uh, I'll be happy to probably schedule a, a, a talk with him. <laughs> now with Zoom, we can uh, we can connect yeah. with him. He's he's quite some uh, uh, someone to just like be proud to have uh, in your life as not only your master, but he's a good friend. He's a role model. He's uh, one of the peop- the few people I call when I'm stuck or I need motivation. So, so Sensei Sinzi has been um, uh, uh, the Sensei for the the club at the University of Rwanda until I'd say probably two thousand fifteen uh, because he then moved to to Kigari. Um, he changed the job, and he has now um, a club of uh, his own that uh, where he. Uh, trains uh, advanced students and uh, also some kids that need uh, that want to to start karate. Whenever I talk to someone who's had another person make a, a strong impact mm-hmm. on their lives, whether it's their training or or you know some other aspect, it's because it opened up something in them. They changed in some way because of this this person. Mm-hmm. How did you change as a result of having him around? Um, very, very good question. So I was, I used to be a very um, stubborn kid when I was growing up. <laughs> <laughs> you will not mess up with me. <laughs> before, uh, before you, you say something bad about me or about my siblings, you'll be down. And, uh, you know, I used to fight a lot. Um what I, what I would say, like street fighting, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, when I started karate, with, especially under uh, Sensei Sinzi, uh, it was, um, uh, I learned uh, to be more disciplined. So discipline was really reinforced. And uh, I started like really staying away from fights, you know. Uh, I don't know if it's because I have... Um, an opportunity to fight every time I go to the, to the train. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I became very disciplined. Um, and also, uh, he's someone who uh, motivates you to work hard. Um, when he shares his story about uh, how he, he survived the genocide, you know, he lost uh, pretty much everything and had to rebuild his life. And, uh, uh, he always inspires. He inspired our our um, all of us who were under him to work hard to you know do the best we can, um, and I think that helped us really uh, get among the top um, the top uh, um, martial arts uh, students um, in Rwanda. So we are, uh, I'm, I'm personally very thankful to uh, have him in my life. And uh, I know there were time I was stuck in the, with my my studies and I would just call him and he said, let's, let's go, you know, come and we, we train for a little bit. And um, he would make time at the end of uh, the training to just talk about life, you know, to talk about what's going on, how can you use like, you know, the training, the martial uh, arts training to uh, make your life better, you know. Mm. And um, I always enjoyed uh, the talk we had uh, every time after the training or even if during the training. It was not, everything was not just about martial arts, but he would bring in um, like life experience and, uh, and, um, advices on how we can be uh, better people. I like it. I get it. Yeah. And it makes sense. You know, I, the way I look at martial arts, the way I think so many of us do is that martial arts, our training, our physical tools mm-hmm. become broader. They're things that we can use 
in so many other ways. You know, it's not like we we learn how to use this hammer, and if we're not building a house, the hammer yeah. is useless. Mm-hmm. Yeah, martial arts is useful even when we're not in a fight. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, even if like where every time when I I face a challenge, I I remember like him saying push, you know. Push hard, you know, you are tired, but you got to train. So you train and you know that uh, the more you practice, the more you train, the more you get out of your comfort zone, uh, something good is going to happen. So I always remember um, his his advice and uh, it's uh, it's very, very rewarding to, um, to have had a chance to uh, connect with him. Hmm. Now there was there was something else you alluded to that if you're okay I I want to talk about. You mentioned your brother. Mhm. But if I heard you correctly, he's no longer with us. Correct. Would you mind talking about that a bit? Yeah, so um my brother passed uh during the genocide time um and he was let's see he was uh 6 years older than me. Uh, so the uh, we are six, we were six in my family, uh, so he was the the firstborn in my family, and then I had I have two two sisters and two young brothers. So uh, he at the time uh, when I was growing, because he was he was older than me. By the time he was in um, in high school, uh, he was in a minor seminary. And uh, he had a friend uh, in the seminary who was uh, uh, who did practice martial arts, and I think that's where he he got that kind of uh, uh, love of uh, of martial arts, and uh, I think that's why he was open to uh, when he's home because he was uh, he was a boarding school as well, so he would be home only during the uh, the holidays. Um, so he was open to train, to train me, to train with me a little bit, um, because he his good friend who was martial arts had like you no, know, I can show you a few moves, you know. <laughs> so yeah, uh, then he passed. Um, uh, he was let's see, how old was he? Now going to forget. Uh, he was sixteen, I believe. I don't know. What was he? He was twenty. He was twenty, if I, if I remember correctly. Time, time, time is going pretty fast. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it does that. <laughs> I forget. Uh, I forget. it has been now twenty six years uh, since genocide. So uh, um, sometimes I say, uh, "How old was I?" <laughs> yeah. So he was twenty because I was uh, I was fourteen. Yeah, so he uh, uh, wanted to become a priest. Uh, he was in my inner seminary and a uh, very good guy. Uh, so he really, uh, like when I think about about my journey in, in martial arts or even if my childhood, uh, every time, every, there are many things I wish, like I wish he was here, you know, he will be happy to know that I, Continued martial arts, and uh, you know, I earned my black uh, belt. You know, <laughs> uh, I think actually when I was training for uh, my black belt, because um, it was intense training, uh, uh, both first and second degree, I was always like pushing uh, because I knew he was going to be uh, proud of me. <laughs> mm. Yeah. It's it's such a it's such a foreign thing mm. for me, you know, and and that's something, and this is why I asked about it because, you know, we're we're talking about these tools that martial arts gives us. We're talking about these, um, these benefits that we have in day to day life, but genocide is not day to day. Yeah, the the what happened in Rwanda was not day to day and you know it's as, as you said it was it was years ago it was many, more than half your life ago mm-hmm. but i can i can hear 
I can hear it in your voice. I can hear how important he was. And I can hear how you've continued with martial arts because of him, at least in part. Yeah. And, and, you know, you mentioned, you, you know, that he would be proud of you. And so even though, how do I want to say this? When we think about who we are as people and who we are as martial artists, it can be really easy sometimes to point to certain people and say, oh, that person taught me and that person was my main training partner and that was my parent and these people lead us to be who we are. Yeah. But you did of the people that you've, you've talked about, he, he's first or second, you know, in, in the way that you've spoken. So I get the sense that he was pretty significant in who you are now and, and how you grew up. Am I, am I right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. Now, was that because he was, I think you said six years older, he's an older brother. So you're looking up to him. Yeah. Uh, okay. I was looking up to him and also he, um, in my family, when we were growing up, uh, and it's very common in, uh, in, uh, in many cultures, actually, you know, like, uh, the older kids, the older, the, um, the, the elder siblings, they have to give a good example, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I remember in, uh, my, my, my mother, she, she retired uh, um, now, but she was uh, uh, a teacher in elementary school. So when I was growing up, it was not allowed to uh, not uh, be among the first um, I, I, or the top five students in, in school. Mm -hmm. was not allowed. You know, we had to study really hard. Um, both my parents worked really hard to put us in school. And um, so... For for him, he was under a very strict uh, education, you know, strict discipline from uh, from my parents, uh, and he had to be uh, to give us a good ex a, a, a example, you know. He he has to show us that he you know you have to respect your your parents, you have to respect the elders, you have to do uh, good in school, you have to do, to be good, you know, in everything. Um, so because he went under that really strict, uh, discipline, uh, by my parents, um, all of us were looking up to him, um, including my, 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 my two sisters and two brothers. Um, but, uh, outside of that, he was, uh, someone who, uh, would enjoy like being outside, you know, and, uh, um, every second will be we just like be outside and you know practice. Uh, even if I said uh, watching uh, movies, we we had a very strict uh, uh, time uh, to watch to watch movies. You know, like one movie like a Saturday after we finish our homework. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, and then we were like uh, we were raised under very strict. Uh, um, uh, discipline and strict education so he always like step up to be a good example and uh, i think uh, um, all of me and my siblings still look look up to him and say no uh, i did this because he my you know um, my brother uh, did that you know mm. so uh, i there was a time where um, I was not into karate a lot. Um, I did uh, uh, I did play uh, do uh, soccer because uh, soccer is very uh, common in Rwanda. And most of the kids at, at um, schools they they play soccer. Uh, and he was not much into soccer, um, but for me and my two young brothers, we were just like into soccer, playing soccer all the time. Uh, but he was not into soccer. He would play, uh, he would do a little bit of martial arts or he would spend time in a quiet place uh, writing uh, poems. And um, the, that was him. Um, 
but I, I still, I still uh, think that it was good for me to have my passion other than the, the karate because uh, me and my two young brothers, we really bonded over soccer. Um, but when I started martial arts, actually, uh, they, a few years after, they they joined the the, the karate uh, as well. <laughs> So it's uh, it's interesting how we give uh, our uh, siblings um, uh, how we 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 influence or affect our, our mm. siblings. So both of both of my young brothers uh, they they did practice martial arts for uh, for many years as well. And I think I heard you say that when you first moved to the U.S., you you didn't train for a little while, and you. Uh, yeah, it was in 2010, you started training again. I started tra- training uh, very, um, I'd say probably just like 2015. Um, okay. you probably know Sensei Matt Butler um, from the mm-hmm. uh, White Crane. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so he and Keen. So I have known him for, I'd say, five, six years. Um, and uh, uh, when I got here, I want to join, and uh, I was looking for something that is kind of similar to what Doryu, because that's the style I did. Um, and uh, when I was looking on online, I could find something similar that which was in Bradeboro, and um, um, I, I believe you actually was uh, uh, one of the schools that. Uh, was uh I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm maybe lo- i may maybe wrong but i think uh um, sensei uh mark is related to to that school um okay. And, okay. And, and what is it you're training now so i still do what are you um I have not joined uh, the um, like Sensei Matt as like a, a student. I still I go there just to really practice, uh, but I'm not. Uh, I didn't start like a new style, you know. Go through all the phases. I usually go there to train, and uh, I train uh, myself uh, um, at home as well. Okay. Yeah. Right. And and. I guess the question is why, why, why haven't you started in that in that other style? Is it is it that you're well? I don't want to put words in your mouth, so I'll just leave the question there. Why? <laughs> uh, yeah. So he, uh, since him, uh, but he does like a Shorin Ryu um, or Gojo Ryu. Um, he did. Uh, he does also like Kobudu. I know. And uh, I think at that time I didn't have enough uh, enough time because I was I was working uh, uh, two jobs and I was a full time student as well. So to me it was uh, I I didn't want to be like committed to you know when you start a new style you have to be committed to going to uh, the um, to the dojo um, every week you know. Um, so I didn't have that commitment uh, because of uh, time constraint, um, and uh, I would just like join whenever I can uh, because I want to stay uh, physically fit. So I think that was uh, one of the really the main thing that kept me away from starting a new a new style. Uh, it, it's not that I I was. Uh, I was not interested in uh, starting something new, uh, or because I didn't want to deviate from uh, from my style. What do you? But it was uh, just time constraint. Uh, but now, because I'm done with uh, with school um, and uh, I'm just working, so I'm considering actually now starting like a, a new style. Um, I may join. Uh, I may join. Uh, I may join him and uh, and start from scratch because now I have. Uh, I think I feel like I can uh, squeeze in uh, something mm. new. <laughs> I get it. I get it. You, we 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 talk on on this show that 
martial arts is always there for you. It can be there for you a little bit. It can be there, you know, on the shelf. Sometimes you have to put it down. You mentioned taking some time and, and soccer. Yeah. Football was was your priority. Yeah. And and that and that's okay. And and that may not make sense to some people. There are some people who train every day. I'm not one of them. Yeah. So I, I understand there are times when martial arts is a big part of your life. There are times when martial arts is a smaller part of your life, but it's always there in some way. And I think that that's the beauty of it. It's hard to play most sports, most team sports, unless you're going to make a significant commitment. People don't want you to be even on a, a recreational team mm-hmm. unless you're going to come to all the games and the practices. Yeah. But martial arts, you mentioned practicing on your own, practicing at home. Yeah. And I think that that's one of the most beautiful things about it is you can train wherever. I, as I listen and, and do these interviews, I'm, there are times where I'm, I'm, I'm practicing, I'm visualizing joint locks and things. And, and <laughs> you, I'm sure if anybody saw me through the window, talking to this microphone with my eyes closed and, <laughs> and moving my arms in, in really strange ways, they might think I'm insane. Oh yeah. Yeah. I, but I'm, I, I'm inspired. Get I definitely get it. You know, yeah. um, uh, well, sometimes when people, are, excuse me, sometimes when people ask me, so, uh, you training, especially my, uh, my friends from Rwanda that I, I practiced, uh, with, uh, for, for so many years, so many years, because, uh, what the karate did, we created this really, uh, strong family, you know, and we are still very good friends, uh, uh, and we, we just check, we have our, like, uh, platform where we share like news and we are very supportive to each other. But I remember uh, when sometimes they asked me and I said, no, no, I'm still recovering because uh, when I was, uh, uh, especially at the university uh, training under Sensei Sinzi, uh, we, it, it was a busy time, you know, there were, there were many, many sessions where we, have like a big tournaments coming and uh, we were trained like three times a day, you know, um, morning from 5 a.m. to 6.30 and then 12 to 1 p.m. and then 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. And I'm telling you, you know, it was intense, intense training. And uh, I was very skinny, you know, I was very strong, but very skinny. So, now I just like uh, putting on some weight, and the people say, well, "So what happened?" I say, "I'm still recovering from uh, from that intense training." <laughs> <laughs> but it was it was intense because my uh, my team, uh, my uh, uh, the clubs, uh, the club that, that sensei for, uh, from Sensei Sinzi, it was a very strong team. So he would not take any any excuse for not training, you know. He will be there to help to train us, and uh, uh, the, if if we go out for the competition and we don't win, we were in a big trouble. You know, I remember, I still remember, like him saying, um, "I trained you now. Uh, when you'll be fighting over there, you know, it's it's I'm not there. You know, your mom is not there. I am not there." <laughs> I gave you all the tools you needed. Now go fight. And for us, fighting was not, uh, it was not a joke. You know, it was uh, intense. It was very intense. And um, I, I think I did, uh, I did practice so much at the point where I, uh, after, after I, uh, I finished school and I stopped being on, uh, on a team that was going everywhere. Um, nationally, internationally, doing um, uh, competition, uh, I, I needed time to recover. Mm. But there are little things that I still do. You know, I remember one of the the thing uh, Sensei Sinzi would uh, tell us. You know, uh, when you practice like your my Gary, you know, um, your kicks. He says, well, imagine you coming from uh, the bathroom and um, to take a shower and you don't have a tower with you um, and you have to wear your, you know, put in your shoes. 
how do you kick uh, the war out? How do you shake the war out of your body? <laughs> you do a few like kicks down. <laughs> so every time I'm coming from uh, uh, taking a shower, I just see myself, oh, I'm doing this. And I remember, I always remember, you know, uh, since they would say you can shake water, it's, it's kind of a sort of a kick you are doing. You know? mm. um, that, that would be a great test. Yeah, <laughs> you know, we, we hear we hear all these these jokes, especially about Chinese martial arts masters, and they can fly and read minds and and catch arrows in the air. But if you could dry yourself without a towel, <laughs> I think that I, I think I don't think anybody can do that. But how close could you get? That's what I'm wondering. And and I think next time I shower, I'm going to try. Yeah, try just to shake your uh your uh your feet a little bit and uh, you know it's like a sort of like a few my girlies you are you are doing fast you know and those little things are those little things that uh he they, how he was explaining you know this you could apply this this move to this and that it there are little things like that that stuck in my in my brain you know so um, to go back to to your to your question, um, it's uh, I needed kind of to fear I'm not under pressure to train hard because I went in, uh, I did uh, more than ten years of intense training, um, and uh, I just said you know now I wanted to train for fun. Um, so when I get up in the morning, I can do a little bit of uh, push-ups, you know, kicks, and um, and I feel good. I get it. Yeah, but I also I also acknowledge that uh, um, it's always good to be in a dojo because you created that kind of a family friendship, and uh, you learn. You know, I get to to learn and uh, to learn new new moves, new techniques. For sure. Now you you mentioned your your parents their, their expectations of you that your academics that you would do really well in school. Did they also expect that of you with your martial arts? No, no, actually okay. not. Because uh, uh, when uh, when I started martial arts, I was a little bit sick, so I had uh, problems with my stomach. So I had a terrible uh, stomachache, um, and uh, the uh, actually I was asked to to stop, you know, because I was always in pain. Um, but it was my passion. There was no stopping, you know. I remember my my mom uh, saying, you know, um, it's costing me so much money to to buy medicine for you and here you are uh, doing karate which is really um not so good because it was intense intense training so that was affecting my uh, my uh, health um, uh, so uh, i was asked to stop but i did not stop so i end up actually uh working uh with um uh, sensei for me uh, to come up with uh, not an intense uh, training I would do, you know, and that helped me to get through uh, my illness and uh, uh, be, uh, I mean, here, uh, but also keep doing my, my karate. But my, my mom was definitely, uh, you know, like, yes, you can, uh, you can do other you know, exercise, but karate, uh, it's uh, it's something that requires more strength and more, you know, because we were fighting a lot, um, and there were many times I would go, I would get injured. So, and uh, the karate not being uh, were seen at that time in Rwanda, um, I guess yeah, many people were okay practicing, but I. I think there was that fear that uh, the people who are practicing karate they are they can get in trouble easily. You know, get injured easily. You um, you may get in fight uh, in the street that uh, fights that are not necessary that are not uh, necessary. So uh, 
there was a, a reservation for, from uh, my parents to, for me to to do uh, to do karate. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. And so, uh, how about I did, I did it anyway? Go ahead. You know, I did it anyway, and I pushed the hand. <laughs> right on. Yeah. What about movies? So now that you're here, now that you don't have someone telling you you have to do your work, you can't watch martial arts movies. Or have you have you been catching up, watching more martial arts movies? Oh yeah. Oh, yeah, oh, I had a yeah. feeling. <laughs> you you know, I still go even if to those uh, old movies. I, I I I cannot tell you how many times I have watched uh, the Karate Kid. Uh, <laughs> it's a classic. I think I think it is the most. I, I'm I. I will say it is the most important martial arts movie of all time. It's certainly my favorite. Yeah, and, but I, I think it is the most important. And yes, I I mean that. I'm sure there are people yelling at whatever they're listening on right now <laughs> because I'm saying that over Enter the Dragon. But yes, I think. It is. Yeah. So I always like. I'm still watching those. I have seen them, but I just like miss that feeling of seeing it like the first time. And, you know, I, I can definitely uh, confess that I probably watch that, the, those, those movies like uh, three times a year, four times a year, you know, the way of the dragon, you know, <laughs> uh, the kickboxer, the lion oh, heart, kickbox. you know. The police story project, you know, the young master, the drunken master, all those movies. <laughs> you're, you're naming them all. That's all. It's, no, wow. I I still like go home and you know I pour myself a glass of wine, I put my feet up, and you know, they look out, and you know it's sometimes I say, oh, that's the that's my way of practicing karate, you know, <laughs> <laughs> by osmosis. Yes, but it, it does help, you know. Every time I finish watching a movie, I I see myself walking around, like doing kicks, you know, punches, you know. Uh, it helps. It helps. Yeah, you don't need, uh, as my my sensei Sinzi used to say, you don't need a uh, uh, big space to practice karate. You can practice karate like in very uh, contained. Uh, very small area. So I see myself uh, in my living room, like doing kicks, you know, and uh, wax on, wax on. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I... And they make sense now. They, now that yeah. they have grown up, and now I say, oh, wax on makes, <laughs> makes, <laughs> it makes sense. So, and I think there is uh, uh, something we learn uh, when you watch those movies with an like I'm now like more mature and I have a good understanding of martial arts. Uh, so when I watch movies now, they make it more sense. You know, there is all there's of of course some exaggeration some in many movies, but when when you watch those movies, you say, oh okay, you know, uh, the those moves they make sense. You know, or you know there is. Uh, you have to practice. You have to go running. You know, I didn't like running uh, at the time. You know, I running because you know you you know cardio and you know and uh, it's uh, I I I see the movies with another kind of lens. Uh, um, so which is it's always interesting. Nice and. I'm going to ask you a couple questions that are a little more hypothetical. So you know, we've talked about movies and, and, you know, you've, you've got quite a, uh, an appreciation for martial arts movies. Mm -hmm. So the question is, if you could be in a martial arts movie with someone, anybody, mm -hmm. who would that be? Ooh. One person, how big, I think I would want to be in a movie actually with, oh, uh, let's say that the people who, uh, the actual people that I met probably practiced the karate with. Uh, I think I would do a movie with uh, my sensei since the Tarsis. Mm. Uh, but I am a very big fan of Bruce Lee. Um, in fact, I have a big uh, poster of Bruce Lee in my room. 
as a reminder of uh, you know, working hard. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, I think if it was a choice for one person, definitely I would want to do a movie with uh, my sensei, Sinzi, because he, yeah, he's, uh, I call him like my, he's, he's my father and he's my uh, hero. <laughs> Yeah. What are your goals? You know, martial arts has come in and out of your life, but it it seems like it's always been there in at least some context and you have plenty of years left. Where where do you want to take your martial arts? Wow, that's that's a loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> that's why I save it towards the end. Yeah. I think uh I I would see I see myself definitely uh being more active. Um like my dream uh when I uh dream about my job my my, uh, my house. My dream house is going to have a dojo. So that's something that's will be happening in the near future. You know, I want to have my own dojo in my house and I still look up to my sensei Sinzi uh, because he practiced pretty much every single day. And uh, he's, um, I would say, late 50s, probably, or 60s, late 50s, probably. But I'm telling you, he's, uh, he's someone who I want to become. I want to be like him, who uh, like someone who practice every single day, no matter where you are, no matter no matter the situation, the conditions you are in. But practice. If, if you cannot go to the jo- to the dojo, you know, just go in your dojo at, at home. So I definitely foresee myself having a dojo in my house and practicing um, because. Uh, sometimes I make excuses, you know, oh, um, no, my knees are not that great now. My back is hurting, you know. He always, like, tells me, like, stories and he say, you know, uh, you, if you start, like, thinking like that, you're not going to get my age. You got, uh, got, uh, get to be my age and uh, practice karate, you know. And uh, I... I remember even if when I was like a very fierce fighter, I would not stand in front of him. You know, we were always like a, a train and, you know, fight, you know, but I was always on the ground. You know, he's very fast. He's very strong. And um, no matter, like I see like many, uh, you know, well trained, good students now in Rwanda, but we cannot stand in front of him, you know. So when I look up to him, I say, Gosh, I, I wish when I get older, I would be like Sensei Sinzi. So that requires me to start training now that I have time. <laughs> <laughs> and it's going to happen. I'm very positive that it's going to happen. So I have a plan and uh, I'm a. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm I'm working on it. Good. Uh, I need time to kind of uh, rest from school and uh, working crazy hours. But uh, I think I I have uh, things in my hand right now. So training is coming my way. Wonderful. And and you know I've got a feeling because you're so close, we'll connect at some point, and and maybe some of your training will be some of my training. Mm-hmm. And so as, as we start to, to wind down here, is there, if people want to reach out to you, is there a way they can get a hold of you, social media or anything? Yeah, uh, so on my, uh, I'm on uh, Facebook. Uh, so on Facebook, uh, my, um, my names are Eve, uh, which is Y-V-E-S. Uh, so that's my, my uh, first name. And then... Uh, my middle name, which is Pacific, P-A-C-I-F-Q-U-E. So Eve Pacific is my uh, name on um, on, uh, on Facebook and uh, Instagram. Uh, or you can even if look up, uh, if you type in Google, uh, my names, uh, Eve Gakunde and Kim, uh, 
my phone number. You will find my phone number. You will find my address. <laughs> I wow. Do, I do <laughs> so much. You're there. I do so much in Kin to the point where my contact information is, uh, is, is public. <laughs> Well, so go in Google, type my name, yeah. and you will definitely see me. Uh, and I'll be, I'm always uh, uh, happy to connect with people. You know, you, we share uh, about karate, about life, you know, passion about this and that. So I'm always uh, um, uh, interested in uh, connecting with new people. You never know. You never know where life will will take you. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So you connect with people. There are many people I connected with, and uh, you know, I didn't know that they were going to push me to go do my PhD. You know? <laughs> yeah. What did you get your degree in? Uh, environmental studies. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, like, uh, when I connected with this professor from New York many years ago, I was like, okay, uh, she's going to be my advisor, but I was not thinking about that she was going to motivate me to go do my master's and my PhD. So, you connect with people if you are, you know, um, really connected, they inspire you and you take action and you, I mean, things happen in life. You know? So I think uh, the connections uh, we build, uh, we have to be very careful in who we connect with. And the people you surround yourself are, if you surround yourself with uh, good people, they will leave a good mark in your, in your life. And uh, I always um, put that uh, into like it's it's on my agenda. I have to connect with uh, the right people because I know uh, today I may not see um, the impact they are having on me, but I'm pretty much sure that tomorrow after tomorrow I say I'm very grateful to have connected with so and so. So um, make sure I say, and I I do tell people always like make sure you surround yourself with uh, people who are going to motivate you to do good things. We talked about some good stuff, didn't we? The idea that martial arts can be this pillar that we can use to refer back to, to lean on, to even define at least part of who we are as we find our way in the world, whether that's the town we grew up in or the other side of the world. I think that's beautiful. It's one of my favorite things about martial arts, and I love how Senpai Gakunde talked about that today. I found myself nodding along with quite a bit of what he said and really relating to it. I've got a feeling that many of you did as well. So thank you so much, Senpai. I appreciate you coming on, sharing, and look forward to connecting with you in the future. If you want more, go to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. You'll find photos and videos and links and a whole bunch more. And if you're willing to support us and the work that we do, You've got some options. You can use the code PODCAST15 at whistlekick.com to get 15% off. You could also share an episode, leave a review, maybe on, on Facebook or Google or Apple Podcasts. Or you could contribute to the Patreon, patreon.com slash whistlekick. If you see somebody out there wearing a whistlekick shirt or something like that, say hello. Introduce yourself. We are building something. Slow but steady. And you are part of it. And I appreciate you for that. If you have feedback, guest suggestions, or anything like that, reach out. Jeremy at whistlekick.com. That's my email address. Our social media is at whistlekick everywhere you can think of. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. <laughs>